Oh, so good to be with you. So, so good to be with you and be back at the other home I love, and the other nation I love and city. You may be seated. Thank you so much. I'm just beside myself a little bit excited and uh, about what God is doing. I look around this room, and I remember those days in the living room. Even though I wasn't there in person, my heart was here in those beginning days of meeting. And uh, I remember the, the first Sunday on Stratford Road. Wasn't it Stratford Road where we were, Emma? And uh, in just believing God that somebody would show up. And, uh, and then I, I turned around this morning, and here you are. And you are a direct answer to prayer. Thank you. Thank you for your yes and saying yes to God for what he is doing right now in the earth and what he is doing in your city and in your nation. And you know what? You're going to reap it back. In the beginning days of the ramp, I remember uh, when God, I had been in the ministry for over 20 years at that point, when the Lord showed me in my hometown of Hamilton, Alabama, the need in the youth, the need in the young people. I never dreamed of working with young people, didn't have any plans to. But what he said to me whenever I was trying to explain to him why I wouldn't be the one to work with young people, he said to me, but what you invest in the lives of other young people, you'll reap in your children because what you sow is what you reap. That's what the Bible says. And so I learned a wonderful principle then that whenever we are giving ourselves to the heart of God and whatever he's asking us to do, we will reap it back in the things that matter to our heart. It will come back. And so what you're, what you're a part of today is going to impact your family. It's going to impact your life first individually. It's going to impact your family. Listen, honey, for generations, for generations. And not only that, in fact, I don't, I don't have time to get off on this. We found out many of our ancestors are actually from England. Most of my ancestors are from England. And we were in York recently and found out that, I mean, my great, 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 great grandmother, they were married at St. Samson's Church there. And, and I mean, we just, it's, it's a huge, wonderful history. And I was standing here this morning in worship with my feet on this soil and just sort of felt the word that says, and may the Lord, the God of your ancestors, just bless you. And I realized, you know what? I've got a feeling I had some grandmothers and grandfathers on this soil here in England that knew and loved our God. And somehow in time, God sent their great, 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 great granddaughter into the future back to a land that they loved to just be a part of reaping a harvest in a nation that they love. Now, how good is God? Now, this is going to happen for you. What you are investing, even in this mission in the heart of God, to reap the souls of Manchester, you can expect it's going to impact your life and your children till Jesus comes. Who's in? Amen. Who's in? Anybody in? in? I want to know who all is in. in. Come on, say, I'm in. in. Let God hear you say, I'm in. in. And he hears that, he sees your heart in that, and he'll honor you for it. I love that. I'm trying to decide, do I want to show this? But what time is it? Mm, I've got time. I've got time. We, sh we, we showed this yesterday uh, at the women's conference. Clay, can I do it, sweetheart? Okay, good. I can? Okay. So um, we, we showed this little clip. It's a video. It's a, it's a five-minute video. It's a little longer than normal, but it's not too long. And, uh, but I love to show you this in case you are new and a part of being a part of the, the ramp family. It sort of gives you an insight into a picture of our global mission and what our heart is. We are for the lives, every life individually, no matter how old they are, everybody that, that just their heart moves when they hear this particular mission. Every church matters to God, and, and every life and their purpose and ministry matters to God. But when you're a part of a ministry and God sends you to a place like the ramp, and you hear its mission and it resonates in your spirit, there's a reason for that, and you should pay attention to it. All right? That means you have an assignment in that place. When something moves your spirit with peace or stirs your heart with compassion, take note of that. Your destiny is usually found in the place that catches your attention, all right? So whenever you sense that, I wanted you to see this video because it gives you an insight 
into what God has been doing for the last 20, about 22, 23 years in Hamilton, Alabama through the ramp. And the reason I want you to see it is because that's what's about to happen here in Manchester and in, this, in the United Kingdom because of the word God gave us. And listen, some people think the ramp is just a young people thing. It's a youth thing. I don't know how they could think that. They got all got to do is look at me. No, it's not just a young people thing, all right? But it's a, it's what, what is the assignment of the ramp? It's a harvest thing. It's about not just young people, but it's about the harvest of souls. Everybody, every life matters. No matter who, what, what nation they're from, no matter how old they are, God loves souls. In fact, the clock is ticking right now. Every second is still ticking, according to 2 Peter. The only reason time is continuing, Peter said it, is because God is giving people time to repent. The only reason time is going on is because says God is saying, if I can just wait another second, if I can wait another hour, I can get that one. And, and then if we'll just wait a little bit longer, I'll, I'll get that one. If we can wait a little bit longer, we'll get that one. There will be a day, though, when time will be no more. So we are working against time for the sake of souls. We have a, it, honey, it's the only reason we're breathing. It's the only reason we're living on this planet right now, trapped in time, is for the sake of souls. Come on. It's not just so we can get a bigger bank account or a better house or drive a better car. That's all fine if you have that. God wants you to. However, what it really is about is that we can live our lives to please him and reach them. Come on, that's the reason you're breathing. It's why you're on the planet. Your purpose is wrapped up in impacting somebody else's life for the kingdom of God. So, you know, the, the, the word that we received, and actually the original call for me to Manchester in 2004, it did involve the youth of this city. It involved actually this, a lot of, what, what really laid in my heart were the students the, at the University of Manchester and all the young people of this whole region. And my heart was deeply gripped by their need. And when God spoke to us in 2014, 10 years later, that it was time to begin, he said he would raise up an army of the young that will come with a loud shout. Now, how's the army of the young going to come when people, mothers and fathers, rise up in intercession, building a wall around them? Providing a place for them to meet. Come on, everybody's needed, no matter who you are or how old you are. And whenever you watch this video, we now want you to watch the faces of these kids. Their faces are what it looks like to see a young man or a woman go from darkness to light. What you're going to look at is their faces that's showing you what happens to young people when they encounter the presence of of the living, real God. What happens? Young people that are in depression are transformed with joy. Young people that are bound with drug addiction are absolutely set free to live with purpose. Young people that are bound in pornography and sexual addiction and perversion have their hearts fulfilled and they understand their identity and who they are and they want to live a pure life and go after God. What you're about to see is just the little glimpses of a few of the faces I've looked at for over 20 years and that you are about to see in Manchester. So I grew up in a pastor's home, but by the age of 13 years old, I had a private sin addiction to pornography where I had gotten entangled with this thing and I couldn't break free from it. My mom began to pray for me and as she did, the Lord began to speak to her about making a greater spiritual investment into my life. So she takes me to this little meeting in Hamilton, Alabama with a lady named Karen Wheaton who had just started working with young people and God was doing something. We didn't know a whole lot about it. She takes me to this meeting and as I'm there in worship, I begin to sense the presence of God, love of God, dealing with my heart. I'm resisting it, I'm battling, I'm going back and forth. You know, I'm, I'm embarrassed, I don't want my mom to see too much of what's going on. But in a moment, someone grabs the microphone during worship. It says, there's someone here tonight, you're depressed, you're suicidal, you hate your parents. 
But if you're willing to come down to this altar, God wants to set you free. And in that moment, the love of God breaks in. A tangible experience with the love of God that sets me free. I feel in a moment, not only tears running down my cheeks, I also feel the weight of sin and suicide and depression rolling off of my shoulders as God initiates a process in me of walking in total freedom. That night changed my life. It began a lifestyle of pursuit to where now, to this day, it's been 18 plus years since I've looked at one pornographic image because he whom the sun sets free is free indeed. For as long as I can remember, I struggled intensely with fear and intimidation. I was scared of what people thought of me. I wanted them to like me. I wanted people to accept me. I wanted to fit in. Through middle school and high school, I just struggled with this fear. But when I was 15 years old, God encountered me at a winter ramp. And it just, He awakened me to the more of God. There was so much more to His love and so much more to what He thought of me and He loved me. And after that moment, I knew I had to come to Alabama and go to the Ramp School of Ministry. So when I graduated high school, I was, God, I was like, God, whatever it looks like, whatever it sounds like, even if I'm terrified and I don't know what I'm doing, I say yes. And every time I said yes, bit by bit, those fears and those intimidations started to fall off of my life. And by the end of my first year, I felt so free from fear, so full of joy and peace. There was a moment where God encountered me with his love, and he showed me that I'm his child, I'm his daughter, and all that fear completely broke off of my life, and I have never been the same. I was sitting there watching kids get baptized over and over again and just kids going in the water getting set free and I'm in the water just staring at it, everything goes silent and I just feel this tug to just from the Lord just to go get baptized so I tell my parents hey I, I need to go get baptized so I run down the hill probably cut some people in line and I get to the front of the line down the steps and into the water and Miss Karen's looking at me with this big smile and everything goes silent again and I just hear her say it's over and I get baptized and come up and when I come up this weight just lifts off of me and depression anxiety that I've had for about 18 years of life at that point just lifted off of me and I was made new and brand new in these waters. Let's give God praise this morning for every life changed. God did that, and nobody else but God. The same God that changed their lives will change your life. That testimony that Micah gave, he says, it's been 18 years since I've even looked at an image. I've seen that young man walk out that testimony. He now pastors Ramp Church. But I just feel like this morning there's someone here that needed that hope that you don't have to live in that bondage for the rest of your life. Whatever bondage it is, the blood of Jesus is stronger and his love for you is stronger. And the same God that set Micah free is the God that sets you free today. 
Let's just pray right now all over this room. Lift up your heart to the Lord. Lift up your hands. Jesus, I thank you that you are in this room right now. And your power is here. Your love is here to set every man and woman free. Even, Lord, those that have felt lately like they have been tormented in their mind. In the name of Jesus, I declare that the torment is over and peace has come. And in Jesus' name, I declare over your life freedom from the chains of addiction and bondage. And that I declare the truth today of who you are sets you free. Will you right now where you are just say, Jesus, I receive your forgiveness, your finished work by the power of your blood. And I declare out of my mouth, Jesus, you are Lord of my life. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Give him one more praise. Thank you, Lord. Well, that was worth coming for today. Just to know that there's hope for you. Y'all, I am so excited about what God is doing. I believe the time is now for Manchester and for this region. I just can't help it. I'm so stirred in my spirit. I mean, we've been believing for this for years, but something is saying that the time is now, and you're going to be right in the middle of it and a part. And this work on Oxford Road, you know, at, is it St. Peter's House, right? St. Peter's Chapel, something like that? St. Peter's House. It, y'all, here we are. We're going to be right there on the campus of the university. Come on, are you ready to go fish with us? Come on, I'm ready to go cast some nets and go some fishing. In Jesus' name, we're going to see we're going to see a great awakening. I don't believe that room's going to be big enough. I believe we're going to start there, and we're just going to launch out for wherever God sends us, and we're going to see a great harvest of souls. Just shout, I believe it. I believe it. And I want to invite you today. First of all, let me just say, do you love Joe and Stacy? Don't you love them? I love this couple more than words can say. And to all of this team, Clay and Olivia, I mean, our interns. And I could just take our time just thanking so many of you. Emma, just amazing, sweetheart. Blew us away today. Emma, so all these, wor this worship team, what in the world? At the women's conference, I'm like, what is going on? It's incredible, y'all. My two daughters are here today, Lauren and Lindsay. My natural daughters, stand up. My granddaughters, stand up to my granddaughters. Where are they? I think two of them have slipped out, but... Love, love, love. I could just go on and on. So, so many of you to thank that worked so hard today. But before we go today, we've only got a few minutes. I do feel like I'm supposed to leave you with an encouraging word. And it's, it's just an invitation. I believe will help you even in your life. I love this journey with God because it's just this ongoing journey of understanding who he is and just letting him reveal himself in our lives. And then every, every revelation of God will just change you forever. And one of the most important parts of our walk with God and even the journey of the ramp in each of us individually is learning how to follow the voice. Our lives, not only this ministry corporately, but our lives individually is led, everything we do in our lives is, is done because we live following a voice. I just want to pray that over you today, that that voice is made more clear. It's, listen, honey, his voice is everything for you. I mean, I'm telling you, it is everything. First of all, it's, the, it's amazing just that we can talk to God and God talks to us. That's based on the relationship we have with God. It's, it's everything that even any relationship that you have good communication, right? But sometimes we just think that our relationship with God is just based on us doing all the talking. Now, prayer is important. And believe me, I do a lot of talking to God. He hears me a lot. But as much as I love to talk to God, actually the truth is I need to hear from him all the more. His voice to us is critical. It is life. It's the most important voice that we have in our lives. There's no other voice in our life more important than his voice. I love to tell people because it's true. He speaks loud. He speaks clear. 
and he speaks often. God loves to talk. I feel sorry for people who don't believe that and live their whole lives never really being able to identify his voice. Now, the truth is, he is speaking whether they know it or not. He's speaking all the day everywhere, even for people who do not believe in him at all, never ask him to come into their life. God is speaking to them. In, in Romans, this is a beautiful word here. This is, how, this is how loving our God is even to those who do not believe. In Romans, the first chapter, it says this, the, the 18th verse, but God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. In verse 19, this is talking about unbelievers. They actually know the truth about God because he made it obvious to them. You think, unbelievers? actually know the truth about God because he made it obvious to them? How? He tells us. Verse 20, for ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities. Whoa! His eternal power and his divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Whoa. In other words, even nature itself, even the earth itself, all of creation is actually the voice of the Lord speaking out to all, all humanity. I'm real. I'm here. Everything is speaking. Everything he made, whether they believe it or not. That's how he reveals himself in the big picture. Yet, in our lives individually, he will speak with his voice clearly when you learn to hear him. Some people do not believe God speaks to us individually. Shocking. Even Christians Many Christians I have found do not believe that God speaks to us. I mean, I have been before in Bible studies and things like that and sitting in a room with Christians and I'll be, I'll be talking to them. I'll say something like, I heard God say something to me this week. God spoke to me this week, just blew me away. And it'd be Christian people, Christian ladies in a Bible study. And, and when I say God spoke to me this week and you kind of get that look of, you know, she says God speaks to her. She says, God talks to her. That is so weird. I've heard she was weird. <laughs> Have you ever felt that even with family? Yes. That you were trying to tell them something God said to you? Maybe somebody you work with. And as soon as you mention, God said that there's an automatic, almost a wall. I don't want to hear that. For people that do not believe that God speaks. It, it reminds me of Anne of Green Gables. Did y'all ever watch Anne of Green Gables here? It's, one of, it's my favorite movie of all time. All the ladies know what I'm talking about. And in Anne of Green Gables, if you watched it, remember with Marilla, when Anne was talking to Marilla, Marilla's so stoic, you know, she's just like everything is no nonsense. And Anne lives a little bit in her own world. I love Anne. There's a little Anne in all of us ladies. And when Anne looks at Marilla, because Anne is just, Marilla's being so, you know, reasonable only, and, and Anne looks at Marilla and says, oh, Marilla, how much you miss. That's what I want to say to people who do not believe God speaks to his people. I just want to look at all of them and say, oh, my, how much you miss. His voice is everything. In fact, for the people who do not believe that God speaks to his sheep, Honey, I think it's strange if you claim to be a sheep of God and he is your shepherd. I think it's strange if you do not hear his voice. Because according to John 10, 3 through 5, he says his sheep know his voice. His sheep know his voice. I look, put up my picture on the screen. I love this. This is how I want to live my whole life. If you want to see a picture of me and the way I want to live my life, this is the picture of how I want to live my life. Clay, have you got that, sweetheart? That's me. <laughs> 
Come on, that's you. Come on. Don't you want to look like that right there? Everybody else may look distracted and have their head down. I want to live my life right there. That's us. That's you. That's me. The rest of your whole family can just be living their life, going on like that, like that, like that. But as soon as I hear his voice, oh, his sheep know his voice. And his voice is everything. You say, what's Karen? I would love to hear his voice. How do I hear the voice of God? Oh, I'm glad you ask. Let me just give you very quickly a few thoughts. I'm going to scatter through these quick like a rock on the water. Are you ready? Position your heart to hear God. Just start right there. You say, I want to hear the voice of God. Position your heart to hear God. Oh, I love that. Jesus said the Father's eyes roam to and fro across the whole earth. God, one, the God, the only God, the amazing God. His eyes roam to and fro across the whole earth just looking for somebody, just somebody that he can speak to that's listening. He wants to talk. So you position your heart and you just, what do you do? Ask, Father, I want to hear your voice. Father, give me ears to hear what you are saying. Jesus said that statement so many times when he was on earth. Jesus said many times, let him that has an ear to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying. In other words, the Spirit has a voice only for those who have an ear to hear it. How do you receive an ear to hear it? Ask. Ask for an ear to hear. I want to hear your voice, Father. You position your heart. You say, God, if there's anything in my life that's keeping me from hearing your voice, remove it. God, distractions, things in my life that's keeping me from hearing clearly your voice. God, those things have to go. Father, if there's other voices, I need to move aside. If there's an iPhone, I need to shut off more often. Whatever I need to do to move the clutter in my life. God, I want to move out other voices. I need your voice. God, remove sin. Remove anything that is keeping me from you, God. I want to position my heart. Second thing you can do is position your faith. How do you hear from God? Listen, honey, anything you ever receive from God, ever, ever, from salvation to anything else ever in your life will be received by faith. It's by faith. Faith is expressed like expectancy. Come on, I'm looking for it. How do you describe faith? It's, it's a little mysterious unless it's revealed by the Spirit. Hebrews uh, 11 tells you faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. So the natural mind doesn't understand that at all. But faith, faith is expressed in so many ways. Hand me that chair. Faith is expressed with an expectancy of heart. What does that look like? Now, again, faith is it's, it's, it's huge. It's, and, and did you know also in, in Hebrews 11 it says that without faith it is impossible to even please God? Y'all, that's gigantic. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. It says, for he that comes to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Okay, Uh, that's huge. So what does that mean? That means when I come to God, I believe. That's faith. I believe what? I believe he is. What? God. And what else? I believe that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Oh, that's huge. I looked up one time diligently. Right there, you know what it looks like? In in its translation, the word diligence means it's like a dog going after a squirrel. (laughs) Have you ever seen a dog go after a squirrel? Y'all are looking at me like really weird. Okay. We have squirrels in Alabama, but anyway... And when my dog goes after him, he goes after them. That's how you're supposed to go after the things of God with all of your heart. What does faith look like? It looks like expecting God to answer you. When you ask, you start looking for the answer. You start believing. I've asked him. He's going to answer me. I love that. I've asked him for something. Now I'm just looking for it. If I've asked him to speak to me, I need his voice. I am, I've asked for him, his word. Now I'm looking for the word. If you need a word in your life about your marriage, if you need a word in your life about your child, if you need a word in your life about direction, 
The Bible says in, in Proverbs 3, you acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Most people don't acknowledge him and they end up on crazy paths. He has a plan for your life. And if he will, you will acknowledge him, he will direct your path. You don't acknowledge him, you'll end up in a mess. Because he gave you free choice to go your own way. Or you can ask him and he'll reveal his plan and it will blow your mind. You ask him, speak to me. Once you ask, you start looking. That's faith. Once you ask, you start saying, God, I need a word. I'm going to start looking for the word. Now, everything about that is expressed. Honey, once you've asked for something, that's why this pleases God. Expectancy, faith, you're expecting him to answer. Faith has a posture, even a posture of faith. When I come to church, I tell the people at the ramp in Hamilton, Alabama, faith has a posture. So whenever we gather together, even corporately like this, at the ramp in Hamilton, I tell our students this, our ministry students, I tell our church this, that I tell my leadership team this, and I ask them to do it for a reason, not for a show, but for a posture of heart to God. I tell them at the ramp, when you've come to church, you've come to this room on Sunday mornings, the truth is, oh, I love this, we've come to be with God. Now, we love to be with each other, and there's plenty of time for that. But, we, but, but you know what? I can't, some, a person can't meet my need. I've got to have God. So I've come to worship him. Worshiping him will manifest his presence because it helps my mind to focus. I realize, whoa, he's here. After you worship him, he's got something to say. So when Pastor Joe or Pastor Stacy's up here preaching, they are delivering the word of God. Now, if you've asked for a word from God in your life, when you come to this building, after you've worshiped him, you come into this room with expectancy. I came to hear from God this morning. I'm going to hear from God this morning. Are you listening? Are you listening? You're going to hear from God. So what does that look like? I tell him at the ramp in Hamilton, I want your posture to be every time you come to the ramp in Hamilton. I tell them when Joe, when, when, when our pastor's preaching in Alabama or Joe's preaching here, I always tell them, don't sit like this, daydreaming around. You're not going to hear. That's not expectancy. That's hurry up and get through so we can go to dinner. That's hurry up. I'm hungry. Don't expect to receive anything from God like that. Faith has a posture. I tell them at the ramp, if I'm listening to somebody that I'm excited about and I want to hear what they've got to say and what they say is important to me, I'm on the edge of my seat. Come on, my body. I tell my body, you're going to sit here like this. At the ramp, I do not ever sit through a sermon like this, ever. I sit every service at the ramp on the edge of my seat. That's right. I'm 61 years old and this body feels it sometimes. But I let my spirit tell my body, you are going to be expectant and you are going to sit here and listen for the voice of God. I listen. I'm expectant. My body reflects the expectancy of my spirit. Because, honey, you will only receive from God what you receive. I know that sounds strange. I'm, I'm trying to think of how to say this. It's not just being in the room that causes you to receive something from God. He's glad you're here, but that's not enough. It's not even enough the little woman with the issue of blood found out. She found out something. And so did the people around her that day. It's not just being in the room. It's not even, even touching him necessarily that will cause you to receive from God. It is faith that moves God. It is the expectant heart. The woman with the issue of blood, the Bible says that day there were throngs of people crowding around Jesus. In other words, they were in his presence. And all of a sudden, in the middle of all the people moving through a crowd, you've been through a crowded group of people before, and they're all trying to touch Jesus. All these people, he's trying to get through the crowd. The, the disciples are trying to help him get through the people. While well, all these people are touching him, and all of a sudden, Jesus stops and says, wait a minute. Wait. Who touched me? Who touched me? And the disciples are like, what do you mean who touched you? All these people are touching you. Oh, no, no, no. Somebody touched me. I just felt virtue go out of me. Come on. 
I felt something leave me. I felt healing leave me. His virtue is his anointing that destroys the yoke of bondage. I felt virtue go out of me. In other words, he would have said, faith just touched me. All these other people are touching me, but they left the same. But when faith touched him, oh, something. What made the difference from her to everybody else? Because everybody else was just there to see the show. Hey, that's the man. That's the man everybody's talking about. Hey, hey, look at him. Look at him. That's the man everybody's talking about. That little woman had a need that no doctor could meet. She had an issue for 12 years that nobody else could fix. She had a financial crisis because she'd spent everything she had to get it fixed with no help. But she said, if I can get to town today, I've heard that Jesus is coming through and I'm going to go to town. And when I get there, she said, I'm going to touch just the hem of his garment. And when I do, I know I will be well. Oh, hallelujah. How will you receive from God when you walk in this room every Sunday and you say, I'm going to the ramp church this morning and I'm going to worship God. And when I do, he's coming. Whether I feel him or not, I know he's there. And you know what else? I'm going to hear from God. I know, I know, I know that I'm going to hear from God. And when you have that expectancy, you will hear from God. Oh, I've got about three minutes. You got you, you still with me? Oh, la mane. Thank you, Father. I give you praise. If I'm listening for his voice to speak to me, Karen, what am I listening for? I'll tell you really, really, really quick. Let me just go over it fast because I really want you to get this. Oh, one of the most important things I want to tell you, because sometimes people are like, I don't know how to recognize his voice. Let me tell you what language he speaks. I Googled it, so right, this has got to be true, right? <laughs> there are over 7,000 languages in the world today. So he speaks over 7,000 languages. But way more than that, according to Google, there are 7.8 billion people on the earth today. How many languages does he really speak? 7.8 billion at a minimum. At a minimum. What language does God speak? The language of the heart. He knows your language. Not just your dialect or he knows your language. He knows what means something to you. Nobody else knows. I have a sweet friend who red birds mean something to her. In Alabama, we have beautiful cardinal birds, red. They're beautiful. They're red. And every time my friend Cindy sees a red bird, it's a really, a, it means a lot to her for many reasons personally. And Cindy will text me because when she sees a red bird, she knows what God is saying. She'll text me, just saw a red bird. Or she'll text me just a picture of a red bird. You know why? He knows. She knows what that means. God loves you enough to speak your language. When you ask to hear his voice, have the expectancy to look and listen for it. Look for it everywhere. You'll hear it in all kinds of ways. You'll, you'll hear it on a, you'll see it on a billboard. You'll hear it in a song walking down the mall. But the most important way you'll ever hear the voice of God, and this is where I need to wrap today because it's the most important thing I can tell you. No matter what way God will ever speak to you, I'll always know it's based on this book. God will never contradict his word. That would make his word unreliable. And he is not a man that he should lie. Everything, no matter what way it comes to you, will always be based on this book. There will be something in this word that you will find that will be in agreement with what he's telling you. And I love it. My favorite way, there's many ways I love to hear from God. But my most favorite way to hear from God 
is to read this word and all of a sudden let that word jump off those pages. And suddenly I realized this book, listen to me say I'm listening. This book is not a book of just words written on paper. This book is a voice. And when you know the author, the Holy Spirit, and you're reading it, you'll hear the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking it back to you. The Bible says, actually in Corinthians, it says the natural mind, a natural mind cannot understand this book. That's why people read the Bible and say it's boring and I don't understand it. That's the natural mind. We do not. You have to ask and receive the one that wrote it. And when you do, you'll hear what he is saying. Amen. Let's stand.